One of our, uh, how, uh, how well we use cloud and micro, micro core architectures. Uh, that is, cloud is disruptive within it. Uh, micro core architectures like GPU and other things are getting disruptive. If you use them and to your advantage, you will be building better applications and better products for your customers. So that's a disruptive that we got to take advantage of. And microservices and distributed systems are becoming common. Uh, it, it is more common than we think. And, uh, uh, we, we, many of you probably are using Kubernetes and doing this exact thing now. Uh, and the, the other thing is, uh, as systems are getting to uh, get into cloud, they are seeing more data, and they want to get more out of their data. Every customer wants to get more data, uh, more out of their data. And the systems are, even though you're building applications, standard systems, the data centric. It is big money data centric in how application needs to deliver more value out of their data. And last but not the least, customers want more, uh, and they want it now. And if you don't do it, you probably get disrupted by somebody else. And uh, all of these factors are pushing the use of Kubernetes and what we're going to talk about a specific way of doing uh, microservices architecture uh, using data pipelines. So, how many of you know about domain domain design? Show of hands. That's good. A few of you. Uh, I'll take some. A few minutes to introduce the concept. Um, uh, so, idea of microservices is to uh, be able to have uh, autonomous uh, services that can evolve separately, right? Uh, so, domain-to-domain design is uh, is a strategy that says focus on the core domain uh, uh, to preserve the autonomy. So, you can you can your future changes will be consistent with your domain uh, um, objects that you come up with. Right? So talk with your, it, it urges you to talk to your business uh, folks and work with the business folks to define and define and identify what is a cluster of uh, domain uh, events and objects that come together and bar, create microservices around that. Right? And the other thing that you are being increasingly seeing is that um, te agile teams, development teams are getting into be um, like smaller teams, two pizza teams they call it. Uh, if you have more than eight or nine, eight or ten, that's too big. So those kind of teams are becoming not just development teams; they are bringing product teams. That is, they are also delivering, operating, and responding to changes and building and making it like a, their own product, a piece of product which is which is which is independent of other teams. So how, so domain driven design has a strategy there. It's called the bound, bounded context. So you can create bounded context uh, and align them to your, how the business is organized, how the people is divided up, and that allows you to create autonomous microservices that that can um, that so your future changes are are uh, aligned to how your teams are aligned so they can support it, right? And um, well, we, well, they can't be so autonomous. So what happens uh, if you're not aware of each other? You're going to probably uh, how do you stop from standing from breathing into each other's uh, other microservices? Uh, the bound uh, domain domain design talks about creating a relationship in a certain ways. Uh, it's, uh, it's called a context map. Uh, there are seven different ways to relate to. Um, shared kernel is two, two set of bound contexts having a sh small shared data set, so they know and they are aware of each other. Uh, Anti-corruption layer is about, hey, I know you, your microservice is changing a lot, but I want to, I want to, I don't want to get disrupted by how, how much change happens on your side, so I can create a small capability called anti-corruption layer, so it, I can keep away, I can resist changes on your side within my microservices. That's one strategy. And the last strategy, I want, the one that I'm going to, you know, to demonstrate where pipelines come into play, is called the published language. Um, it's a strategy of, hey, um, I, 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 there's a lot of, it's a, it's a complex set of application, uh, with a lot of microservices, autonomous bounded context, uh, I don't want to create anti-corruption layer uh, uh, across against each other. So, published language allows you to kind of consolidate in the way we we are we all of these uh, uh, autonomous microservices can agree, uh, people can agree on a common language to represent the domain and relate their data models, their independent views to that particular language. That's the domain-driven design. Uh, the other concept is even sourcing. Um, Event sourcing is about, um, uh, I don't know how, I, it's about basically for data centric applications. I don't know how I'm going to use my data in the future. Um, how, um, and, but right now, systems are built where transactions change, update.
So the human services view is every change in the world it should only add new data, should not delete or update existing data. So that so everything is seen as events. Um, so the other thing is what well, now I can now I can build different views of the same event, and so I can kind of understand uh, uh, states and build states. An example would be if it was this event, um, the Dev Fest event, and you would have uh, microservices uh, for registration. Uh, and you know, microservices for catering. So you want to uh, you, maybe the only thing that they share is uh, who registered, and they don't need all the information what registration uh, does. So they they can they can listen to the same events and can interpret their own view of the world from it. Uh, that's the strategy. And the other thing that is most important for data centric application is they want to take a different view of the data after they get new insights. So they can go, go back in term and re, uh, time and replay events to get a new understanding with new logic applied to it. That's the, there are advantages, audit is a big advantage, but there are also some trade-offs, um, external system. If you have to build an event sourcing system, doesn't mean every external system you interact with understands your events. You just replay the events doesn't mean you're going to get response back from external system. So you got to be aware. It's, more, it's like you get power, but you got to be responsible. Spider-Man said. With power comes responsibility. Right? Um, so that's the same principle. Event sourcing is also powerful. So what we did is to bring domain-driven design and event sourcing together. Um, and a um, little bit about Golin uh, What we're trying to, I, I talked to you about how uh, we help. Um, um, so if you have development teams, multi, whole, whole lot of development teams, you have. Uh, every team has its own process to some extent, probably, and they have their own tool sets. Um, how do you bring things together so you can do DevOps better? How do you think, as an organization, get better? That's how. That's really what goal, uh, a development so IT organization better. So that's what the goal in that I It's about becoming lean with your products, becoming lean with your engineering, becoming lean with your uh, operations. Um, so, and and, and uh, the problem with the, the architecture of something like that is. Um, you would have a car, um, every, every, every team is different. They have their own process, their own tools. Their meaning of uh, certain things could be different. Story points in one team could be different from our story points in another team. So you got, if you want to look at how our teams across the board doing better at getting things faster, you want to understand different uh, ideas of their story points, for example. At an enterprise level, um, you want to set goals for their and, and make teams understand their goals in their own context. Uh, you want to set policies um, uh, for security scanning and so on if you're doing DevOps, right? And uh, you want to have share, you want to help them learn one, uh, one team that learns about how a peer review process has helped them get better at failure rates. You want to have every other team apply that. So, so there, are, there are different views, and, yeah, and, and last, but not, last but not least, the product level, you want to see how how can is the product getting better? Is it giving value to your business? Is it giving value to your customer? Is it giving value to your users? And that is different from product to product, right? So that's the context of it. So uh, if you really look at it, requirements can be about a context. Requirements and how requirements are and requirements managed. Agile can be about context, how projects are executed, iterations are done, uh, what tools do you use? Teams could be using different tools. Uh, source code could be, uh, every team has its own way of doing, some people would be doing trunk based development, other people would be some probably doing uh, 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 branching, feature based branching or something, code quality is another view, testing is another view, builds are done, uh, and they are all, different tools probably in your organization, uh, different teams are using all of that. But if you, when, when, if you, when you look at them, and how do you bring information across all of these tools, and so you can help them become leaner? That's the challenge of Google. That's very much exactly what you would have problems in developing any microservices context. So you have a bound context like this, and everybody has got a different view of the world. So, um, so it's almost like, uh, uh, so it's it's almost like an elephant, and the, you know that that uh, analogy. Uh, so how do you create the, the, published la the published language pattern is about actually defining an elephant in a way where everybody gets a common understanding of what's going on in their world. So how does it work? Development, uh, people work together and get development done, 
Now you get a common view. Uh, so, uh, so Jira tool would translate and provide uh, across all the teams what stories mean. Uh, Agile tool, you can translate and map the events coming from, say, Rally or Jira to a, a, a common understanding of what task means, what sprint, what sprint means. Uh, and uh, same way, so testing, you would have a common, have a common understanding of what defects, how defects are managed across multiple teams, and how test cases are done. So this is, a, this is, this is exactly how you would have uh, the same issues you would have with any microservices across um, if you are integrating in an enterprise context. There's a, there's a, so it's about defining that, uh, it's about published language is about defining that elephant so everybody has a common understanding of how they come together, right? So with that, I'll show you how pipelines can make a difference when you implement published language. So I talked to you about, um, I, I want you to show, go see, see on the left hand side, the multiple teams, they have their own tools, right? So events are coming from that tool, uh, there's a tool adapter for Jira, Rally and so on, and, and, and Every, every, I talk about event sourcing, so everything becomes a raw event, it gets into one place, and then, but how, we got to get to translate that raw event into the, uh, the, the published language, uh, uh, like a, uh, and that you would do using a small data pipeline. So every event trigger on the fly gets processed by a combination of small, uh, a post a small data pipeline, and gets translated into a, uh, a, a event on the common side. So, let me walk through an example. Okay. So in team A, they may think uh, they, they, may, they, they may be using Jira and a Kanban, and dropping a story from a backlog into uh, develop means they are starting develop. Right. In team B, they may be basically get back to GitHub based or something, and uh, the moment they take an issue that's assigned to them, uh, that is starting develop. So. Development star is, has different meaning in those two different worlds, right? So this pipeline can translate that, and you can write those small, small pipelines of how events uh, uh, in, in, that, in those systems, in their view of the world, uh, how do they become a common understanding uh, uh, in, 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 the, uh, in the published language, right? Once you have a published language is common, now you can write visualizations uh, to see how, which team, what are the lead times for this team, what are the lead times that they take from uh, getting product out uh, across, uh, from a team and start comparing between those teams, who is doing better and how can, how can you help, which team needs what help. So you can start to think about uh, how do I get leaner uh, by using practices of one team and adopting, helping the other team adopt it. So now, so that way, so, so you can build more and more new visualizations that can help you make decisions on you know, change in practices, change in processes. Um, so another example would be, uh, if I add a pre-review practice, uh, would it, does it help me get better at my failure rates? So somebody can put in, uh, uh, um, so you can write a small, uh, whenever a specific uh, development is complete, you can say, you can translate that event into, a, event into an automation, to add a subtask for uh, task for review, so if they so that's what we call as nudge. You can nudge people to do certain work. So and and when they practice it, then you can correlate statistically correlate whenever they perform peer review, is it is the failure rates coming down with it? So you can correlate. You can apply data science and scientific methods to improve your engineering process. So and that is possible because you're. Events that are different in different tools are seen by translated into a lightweight pair of pipelines uh, and executed within the Kubernetes container. So we're going to uh, now I'll hand it over to Shanmugam, who's going to basically show you, walk you through how the pipelines work in the Kubernetes world. Coming up live uh, based on it. Okay. 
but hopefully we'll get there. Okay, yeah, I think we got it pretty well. So, um, but we set up, set up the context. Uh, so, uh, to achieve, to develop microservices, to achieve this high level of modularity and agility, we use a lot of tools and frameworks, and we even code in different languages. But uh, for the purpose of this session, I'll talk about three main major things, uh, because that's the session about. We'll have talk about Kubernetes, Pachyderm, and uh, most how we develop these microservices in Golang. So Kubernetes, it's a, it's a production grade, uh, container orchestration framework, open source from Google, and it's a very active community. Um, we also there are a lot of features coming up uh, on a daily basis, so uh, it's, it's a great framework. Uh, if, if you're in your, in your containers, if your application in the whole system is containerized, uh, the, the reason we chose Kubernetes is we had two different uh, deployments. We have on-premise deployment and we have a SaaS version. So previous to Kubernetes, uh, we had uh, application code, infrastructure code, totally different for these deployments. Um, so that's hard to maintain. Uh, um, with, with every customer, there is obviously different changes. So uh, we went with Kubernetes. With Kubernetes, our application code is same wherever we deploy. Whether we, whether we deploy in Kubernetes, AWS, sorry, Ampum, AWS, uh, Google, in, Google Cloud, wherever, it's the same. And our infrastructure code changes very minimal. And Pachyderm, Pachyderm is one of the uh, pipeline infrastructure that we use. It's a framework, it's a data science framework uh, that lets you uh, develop pipelines uh, and it is language agnostic, meaning you can create, uh, uh, again it's built on top of Kubernetes, so obviously the application has to be uh, containerized, but then you can uh, set up a sequence of action on different languages and, and containerized and then have these pipelines uh, run on top of Kubernetes. Uh, we'll see some, some of it in action. And uh, one of the language, uh, one of the uh, reason we chose Golang, uh, most of our services were in Java. Uh, but uh, as an example, I can show. Um, so, uh, and uh, our inter-service inter communication is uh, REST. So um, our, we, have, we have a lot of services and there is a lot of inter-service inter communication. Even though we are moving those uh, towards gRPCs, uh, our inter-process uh, inter-service communication is still REST API. Uh, and if you're building a uh, REST application on Java, Spring Boot is our choice and we had to be used to it. Uh, this is a simple service that I've shown the size of the container. Uh, just one single service, REST controller. Uh, and when I put it in the controller, uh, it, it's not using Alpine, country, Alpine image, so it's a little bit bigger, uh, uh, but it's just on OpenJDK and image. But you see, it's, a, it's 343 behind, it has not, not much features. Whereas, if you see the next container, that's our, our entire query system uh, uh, that is written in Go, it's 10 MB. So, when we have, when you're building multiple pipelines with a lot of containers in action, uh, the size, it's a less resource. I'm not saying the size of the containers affects the performance, but it, it helps. So when we, we use a lot of source images and there is a lot of movement of Tucker uh, uh, containers, so it helps. And Go obviously has a lot of, uh, uh, it's easier to develop concurrent programs, so that's the reason. So, uh, in this uh, demo, I'll be using kubectl. Kubectl is a command line tool to talk to your uh, Kubernetes cluster. And I'll also uh, Pachyderm. Pachyderm has a similar CTL tool. It's called PatchCTL, so I'll be using those tools. If, if you're new to Kubernetes, you want to try it out. Uh, there is Minikube. Uh, it's not intimidating at all. So you can easily set it, set it up in your laptop, and you can have your Kubernetes cluster running in your laptop in, uh, uh, soon. So to set this context, I'm going to do this. So Badri talked about uh, different visualizations. So I'm going to show how data is. Uh, it's, a, it's a large system, and the events are coming from different systems. How, how there are independent microservices that are listening only to the data that is required and building up uh, data, building up uh, data for this visualization. So uh, this is the visualization. This is one of 
of the visualization for which we have built data. So, um, this is a story activity. We don't have to get into the details of this visualization, but it's, it shows uh, uh, how a story progressed in, a, in, in its own development life cycle. So, this I'm going to show it in my uh, development environment. So, this is a clean slate. I have, I have, I'll set the context and go back into the pipelines, okay? So, I have no data here. And um, I'm going to go into Majira and then do some action. So, that, that's, uh, that's our usual development. Uh, Jira uh, story moves through these phases and it's totally configurable. So, when I did that, So there's a, uh, it was a clean slate, but now we have data. Um, so for the, for the purpose of next uh, demonstration, uh, I need to pump in some events. So I'm going to pump in some events, and I'll, I'll show you uh, what will happen between the scenes when that happens. So this is our uh, SDK approach for. So I'm actually sitting in different context uh, because I'm going to pump in uh, data that came from a different team. Okay, let's go back to uh, what's happening in Pakistan. So uh, my cluster is elsewhere, so I'm doing a port forwarding. So I, I access my Pakistan so that's running in the network. So these are the repos. Right? Uh, in Pachyderm, uh, as I mentioned, it's a data pipeline and a data science tool. Uh, it, is, uh, it helps you to get, uh, it, it's a data versioning system too, uh, meaning uh, it is a Git-like uh, tool. You can create multiple repos. Uh, repos are the first class citizens in Pachyderm. You can create multiple repos uh, and you can have multiple branches in it and you have trans transformation done, uh, done for uh, multiple transformation running on each of those repos. So, uh, for the purpose of this uh, demo, we have uh, five pipelines running. Uh, uh, when we talk about uh, pipeline, it is natural for people to understand uh, pipelines in traditional terms, uh, like a big ETL process is running uh, with multiple transformations. Uh, it's, it's, but here, what we do is uh, the pipelines are very small, uh, and it's uh, even triggered smaller pipelines, uh, and we achieve uh, uh, whatever what they talked about uh, versioning data, uh, publishing language, and anti-corruption layer as part of this pipeline. So it, we are not running big uh, detail processes. So let's just inspect one to make sure. So when I moved a story, uh, in, um, so the, uh, there was an event raised. When I moved a story, so there are a lot of home contexts in the system as well, we explained. Um, well, for the, uh, what we are doing is uh, specific to this bone context. So the, there is a Jira system that's emitting events to our, uh, to our uh, system, and there is a, a Jira tool adapter uh, that is interested in all these events from Jira. But um, it doesn't have, um, and our meta model system is a very large meta model system. So, but the Jira doesn't have to know all the meta model system. For example, Jira has to know uh, what's, uh, how, how to interpret a story. How to interpret a subtask, but not necessarily know how, how to, what is the build for it. So, so these are even though the meta model system, in, you know, the earlier pictures is the elephant, but then there is a restricted view this context takes, uh, and it, it, it transforms uh, the whole uh, pipeline, the whole events coming from Jira into a specific uh, meta model. Uh, and these are done with uh, these pipelines, and uh, once those goes to our meta model store or event store. Um, 
there are different, we have uh, every visualization, it's running its own, uh, it's, it's in its own context. Either it's a set of pipelines, a set of containers, and set of visualizers, it's, it has its own context. But uh, the, uh, it's, a, uh, it's a big system, but it, it knows only uh, a specific set of the meta model. So in this case, for the story activity diagram that we saw, it's, it's interested only in what's happening in the story and only more specifically specific attributes of a story change. So it doesn't have to know what is happening elsewhere in the system. Um, so th that's that's a segregation between the different code contexts. So when publishing a language, we use the data pipelines to do the transformation and publish uh, publish uh, a, a common language. And there are also uh, you know uh, even based uh, pipelines looking into these changes and then uh, bringing up the visualization. So as this was, um, I was putting on more events. Um, this is production. I think it's going to take yeah, it. Yeah, if it is demo, this one, demo cards are not always with us. And it's just a set of JSON data coming back. Uh, I'm sure it is. It's not. Uh, there it is. Uh, so that, uh, I was clicking the wrong report. Okay, so, so there are, so there are uh, events getting processed and, and it's, it's going on a little bit slow. Uh, so, and we talked about different contexts. This is one context. But right now you see there are, there, there are a set of events already happened. So you have a set of events already in your, in your store. Now you decide to see, uh, decide if you want to add something new. Um, so I'll show how to, uh, what we can do by adding a new uh, pipeline. So I'm going to add uh, another um, context set of uh, services to transform data, existing data, uh, into a new visualization. So uh, I'm, I'll try to bring up the other report for development flow. This is about how, um, what's the usual uh, lead time for each of the stories and what's plotted uh, with mode and outliers. Um, so if I show you, so we have we have five pipelines already uh, When I talk about lightweight pipelines, you see the, uh, the story transformation, the whole uh, Thing is done with the image that is only 7, 7 uh, MB in size. Uh, so it, it just have a, a small uh, uh, Golang program that runs the transformation. Uh, I actually I had a couple of I just want to show a couple of uh, <coughs> reports. But basically, the, uh, the, uh, the same approach can be used for um, uh, if you are aware of Stagler pattern, that is converting legacy systems into microservices environment. So your legacy systems could be emitting, they have their own view of data, and you could translate the events that happen in that system uh, into specific common common language and have that serve to the new microservices as they come along. So over a quick period of time, you can switch from legacy to new system uh, with the, seamlessly, and this has, has a, stra has a, has a uh, convert your monoliths into, leg uh, into microservices system but do that using the published language pattern. And th this is a very more powerful way, especially if you have a lot of big complex systems broken into uh, uh, as a transformation that you're doing over year or two to the microservices system. So this, that's the approach we use because we can't control Jira and its model. We can't control GitHub and its model. But, what, but we want to get to be able to get visualization new services come along. This is a, this is a strategy to be able to not touch your legacy system, but yet to be able to convert them in the ways you want. So what I did here is um, I added another visualization in, in, in our 
context of Gortaus, it's another bone context and it's uh, another uh, visualizer. So uh, it created two pipelines that's going to look at the event store and look at the already existing events and it should have created data for uh, we got it. So this earlier this was not there, so we, we got this one. So this uh, that's the whole concept of the architectural pattern of event sourcing. So you have your events stored uh, as a, uh, the, the state the state chain the system chain is tracked as each event, and you have ability to replay the event uh, at any time, uh, and you can derive the new state. So I added a new visualization, but still I was able to replay the old events and then get to the new state. Uh, in, if I can give you an example, you have a microservice and you have, um, uh, and you process the events to it and it delivers your functionality but you realize that you have a bug or you want to fix that. Uh, but obviously it processes the data in the wrong way. Um, uh, suppose if this was a payroll system, right? And you process the payroll but something that went wrong because there was a bug. So all you have to do is, if, uh, uh, there will be, uh, kill that microservice Start a new service, uh, uh, clean up the data for, the, uh, for that particular payroll processing system, and then replay the events uh, to, to it uh, and, uh, and process the payroll again. So that's the same concept that he used, created a new visualization, uh, a new understanding of information that they wanted, and fired the same events that happened in the past and replayed them to the new service. So that's, that can become very powerful, especially for data centric application. That is, if you have a new understanding that you want to go back to history and uh, a new, a new, mob, new algo, if you're, if you're doing data science, you want to try to find out what happened, you, you replay those events to uh, see, hey, if I use the, if I apply this, give this feature, does it help my customer? You can replay that event and find out and see whether it's, uh, you can train models that way and you can, you can um, and it's very easy for you to do that with the event sourcing and published language approach. So, uh, so I created a new pipeline and it, it processed the events. Um, uh, here I'm trying to, uh, still the old events are coming up, it's a little slow. Uh, it, I'm posting it from my system, so that's why we are still in. Uh, I'm trying to delete the data and then reprocess the, um, the existing. Yeah. So, uh, so even the existing uh, pipelines that you want to change, uh, you do a change and replay the events with the changed algorithm, you can do it. And just do and reprocess. And you will start. Uh, so the, the, the data will load back with the change. With the change. So, um, uh, so that's about it. So we are able to we are able to use lightweight data pipelines uh, in, in, in creating a relationship between our different bone contexts uh, against the published language. Uh, that's it. Quickly, uh, another use case that uh, it can, this can be, I was referring to how you can do uh, um, convert your monoliths to microservices. Uh, think of the same way, like the Jira system as a le your one of the legacy system, GitHub as another le legacy system. Now you're building your new microservice. You can use the same architecture uh, of um, uh, events coming in, and you can have the even we have an SDK for pipeline SDK. It's a very you can quickly write event translations, and we have an SDK for published language, so you can add your own language for your domain. And we have an SDK for visualizations that can that can help you pull that together. So now with this foundational uh, mechanisms, you can use a um, domain-driven uh, driven language approach and event sourcing approach to create Kubernetes-based pipelines and uh, and be able to create microservices uh, and strangulate your old legacy system over time. And that's a uh, that's a that's a great use case for most of your modernization. Uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, we uh, we are going to I.O. this is preview. Uh, we are looking to open source those SDKs at some point in the future. Uh, but nevertheless, you can use uh, Golin uh, if you are looking to actually apply DevOps in your uh, uh, in your software development teams. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, if you have any, if you have any interest, you can be an earlier adapter. You can send us an email or earlier adapter at Golin.io.
Are there questions? I can take any questions at this point.